Thank you, sir. Thank you, Pastor. Praise the Lord. This morning, the mercy of God will rewrite the story of your life. A morning of mercy. A morning of miracle. A morning of the manifestation of love in your life in Jesus' name. Am I talking about you? Where are you? Father, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy. Thank you for your grace. No matter how far we have gone, there is the grace of God that is much, much greater than all the sins anyone has committed. And we pray that mercy will come in every life and rewrite the story of every life in Jesus' name. Confirm your word in every life today. Those who are here, those who are online, those in every congregation all over the world, let mercy move in into every life. Lord, we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. God has blessed you. You can sit down. This morning, we're considering an important subject. You see, from the time of us searching the scriptures together, we read from the Old Testament. We studied those important chapters. In the Old Testament, the question is, does that relate to the believer in the New Testament, in the New Covenant, under the covenant of grace, of love, of mercy? Does the moral law have any relevance in our lives? We're looking at the New Testament. We're looking at Romans chapter 1. And I'm reading from verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. In verse 17, it says, For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Verse 18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. New Testament, New Covenant, the dispensation of grace. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth. The truth of grace, they hold the truth. The truth of the gospel, they hold the truth. The truth in Christ, they hold the truth. The truth in the spirit, they hold the truth. The truth of eternity, that's the eternal truth of Christ. They hold the truth in unrighteousness. In verse 19, verse 19 says, because that which may be known of God is manifested in them, for God has showed it unto them. Then in verse 20, it says, for the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even the eternal power of eternal power and the Godhead, so that they are without excuse. We we'll come to Romans chapter 2, reading from verse 14. Romans chapter 2, verse 14, it says, For when 
the Gentiles, which have not the law. That is, they didn't have the two table stones of the law, of the moral law, of the commandments. They didn't have that. They were not at Sinai. They were not with Moses. They were not in Exodus uh, chapter 20. Neither were they in Deuteronomy chapter 5. Those Gentiles which have not the law due by nature the things that are contained in the law in the whole world whether we know the moral law or not everywhere in the world it is demanded that every child will honor the father and the mother in the whole world gentiles or jews anybody old covenant new covenant it is demanded that we will not steal what belongs to other people it is demanded that we will not kill the moral law stands among the gentiles among the jews in every generation and until this day the moral law stands that we will not steal and we will not covet anything that belongs to any other person whether you are gentle you are a sinner you are a saint you are in the kingdom the grace of god only brings us to the fulfillment and to the obedience of the moral law. The grace of God does not cancel our duty, our responsibility of living a life according to the commandment of God. And so it says, these then, having not the law, are a law unto themselves in verse 15 in verse 15 it says which show the work of the law written in their hearts it's written in the heart of every man and it says their conscience also bearing witness and their thoughts the meanwhile accusing or else excusing one another he links this up of the gospel in verse 16 it says in verse 16 in the day when god shall judge the secrets of men the people who hold the truth of the grace of god and they hold that in unrighteousness and you say i'll do it i'll go contrary to the law of god i'll go contrary to the word of god because grace is there uh, they think about grace before they commit the sin and they yield to their weakness and they yield to the temptation thinking that the grace of god will cover everything it should have covered judas it did not it should have covered you know that uh, that couple that came and asked and sapphira and they lied to the holy ghost the grace of god should have covered always 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 all their sins but it does not it does not it's when you repent and you believe on the lord jesus christ that the grace of god comes to you because on that day in the day when god shall judge the secrets of men by jesus christ according to my gospel the gospel still tells us there is judgment and there is the day of judgment and the mercy of god comes in when we repent when we believe on the lord jesus christ and we commit our lives to the Lord that we will not continue in the old way, in the old path. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. We're looking at the message, glorious possibilities through the gospel of Christ. The possibilities that come into our lives through the gospel of Christ. 
Christ, we're looking at three things here. Number one, the law of God legible in every conscience, on every conscience. Number two, the love in the gospel of the grace of Christ. Number three, the Lord of the godly, of godly living wherever and wholeheartedly for Christ. Let's look at number one. Number one, the law of God legible on every conscience. Uh, we are dividing this to three parts. Number one, number one is the law in the conscience of every creature. Number two is the law in the character of all his converts. Number three is law in the new creature, in the new covenant. Think about that. Think about that. Number one, in our conscience, that's what the Lord has done. Number one, the law in the conscience of every creature. We're looking at uh, we're looking at Romans again, reading from chapter two, verse fourteen. Romans chapter two, verse fourteen. And when the Gentiles, which have not the law, do by nature the things contained in the law, in the moral law, you understand. The ceremonial law is gone. And nobody is asked to bring a goat or to bring a sheep or to bring a dove. All those things were read about uh, the ceremonial law. The Lord did not give that to the Gentiles. What he gave to every creature on earth and what he writes on every conscience on earth is the moral law and it says they do by nature the things that are contained in the law these having not the law the ten commandments they are a law unto themselves look at verse 15 in verse 15 which show the work of the law reaching in their hearts, their conscience also bearing them witness and their thoughts, the meanwhile, excusing them, accusing them, or excusing one another. We're looking at Romans chapter 1, and we're reading from verse 18. In Romans chapter 1, reading from verse 18, it says, the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness. What's ungodliness? Talking, walking, living contrary to the law of God. And till this time, because that law is reaching in our conscience, the wrath of God, the indignation of God, the anger of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Look at verse 19, verse 19, because that which may be known of God, that God is righteous, that God is holy, that God delights in righteousness and holiness. Everybody knows that. In every religion, Christian religion, that religion, that religion, the same God is holy. That which may be known of God is known to every conscience. It's manifest in them. Why? For God has showed it unto them. Verse 28. In verse 28, and even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge. There are people they don't want to retain the knowledge that God is holy, that God is righteous, that God demands 
Obedience. They don't want to have that in their conscience or in their mind. And it says because they do not want to retain God in their knowledge. God gave them over to a reprobate mind to do those things which are not convenient. What are the things that are not convenient? What are the things that are not consistent with the knowledge of God, disobedience of the moral law. And then it says in verse 29, it says what he do, being filled with all unrighteousness, fornication, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, debate, deceit, malignity, and uh, it says, whisperers, verse 30, in verse 30, they are backbiters and they are haters of God and they are spiteful, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things and disobedient to parents. New Testament still expects that we will be obedient to our parents our normal, natural, biological parents, our spiritual appearance as well. It says in verse 31, verse 31, without understanding, they cannot put those things together, the grace of God and the commandments of God. They are without understanding, they cannot put those things together, the gospel of the kingdom and obedience to the life and the Lord of the kingdom. They cannot put those things together because it says they are without understanding. They are covenant breakers. They are without natural affection. Natural affection. The affection we have naturally. The, that is love we have. God writes that in our heart. You love your neighbor as yourself is the natural affection whatsoever you want others to do to you do so even to them is the natural affection but the people who are always talk about grace and grace and grace and there's no obedience there's no repentance and there is no love of God and there is no righteousness they're without understanding and they are called Covenant breakers without natural affection, implacable, unmerciful, unmerciful. When you kill another person, you are merciful. And when you steal from other people, you are merciful. When you commit adultery with somebody's wife, you know when the man, the husband hears, it's going to be so sad. Some of them are so sad that they even commit suicide or they kill the wife and they kill themselves unmerciful the grace of God will bring us to the manifestation of mercy to our neighbors look at verse 32 in verse 32 it says to knowing the judgment of God that they which commit such things are worthy of death not only do the same but they have pleasure in them that do them. We're coming to number two here. Number two here is the law in the character of all his converts. All his converts. As somebody told D.L. Moody, and he said, I saw one of your converts, and he was doing this bad thing, wrong thing, sinful thing. What do you say about that? The Elmudi replied, yes, because it's my convert. It's not the convert of Christ. If he were the convert of Christ, Christ enters into him. And Christ lives in him. And he will live by the power and the life of Christ in him. Those who are men's converts. They are the preachers convert. They are the prophets convert. And they are the, they are the converts of the false prophet that tells them, you can drink anything. You can do anything. You can go anywhere. You can dress anyhow. Because according to that false prophet, 
the moral law is gone. Anything you do now, they say grace covers it. They will discover in eternity that sinners spend eternity in the lake of fire in hell. Now, the converts of the Lord, the com is converts, the converts of Christ. What law do they live by? What principle do they live by? And what commandment do they live by? Look at what Christ said concerning his own converts. We're looking at Matthew chapter 7, reading from verse 12. He says, Therefore, all things whatsoever ye would that men should do to you, do ye even so to them, for this is the law and the prophets. That's the proper interpretation of everything proclaimed by the prophets and by the law. Whatsoever you want others to do unto you. Do you want others to cut you down? Do you want others to destroy your life? Do you want others to lie against you? Do you want others to bear false witness against you? Do you want others to covet your wife, covet your property? No. Whatsoever you don't want others to do to you in the kingdom with the moral law that we have and with the grace of God and the mercy of God that comes to you, whatever you will not want others to do to you, you'll not do to them. And whatsoever you want others to do to you, do to them. That is the character, that is the lifestyle of his Converse, look at chapter 22, Matthew. Matthew 22, I'm reading from verse 37. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thine heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. In verse 38, he says, This is the force and great commandment. You love the Lord with all your heart. Why? Because he's creator. Because he's redeemer. Because he's the one that planned our salvation. And we're so grateful to him that because he first loved us, then we love him. What's the implication of that? If you love God, you will not take any other sin to replace God wood stone gold silver will not be your God if you love God you will not take the name of the Lord in vain you will not jest with his name joke with his name like those drunkards do when they are out of their senses if you love the Lord you will not make anything anything in the sea anything in the ocean anything on land any bird or you will not make and carve out a bird and say this is thy God oh Israel if you love God which is the first commandment and the first law you will take the day of the Lord as honorable. You will honor that day of the Lord. If you love the Lord, you will appreciate the Lord and worship the Lord. He gives you all the seven days and you take one one day and then you'll be thinking about the Lord you'll be planning about how to glorify the Lord and your life will be glory glorious unto the Lord the Lord says even in the new covenant even with his converts if you are his convert you will love the Lord with all your heart all your soul and all your mind look at verse 39 verse 39 and the second is like unto it, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. 
What does that mean? Let the Bible tell you. In Romans chapter 13, reading from verse 8. Romans chapter 13, verse 8. Oh, no man anything but to love one another. New Testament. New covenant. For his converse for the people who have turned away from sin and from Satan and from self. And they have turned unto the Lord as their savior. They come to the Lord and as they come into the kingdom, the Lord tells them, Oh, no man anything but to love one another. For he that loveth another has fulfilled the law. He that loveth another has fulfilled the Lord. Look at verse 9. In verse 9, for this thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness, thou shalt not covet and, uh, and dare. dare and if there be any other commandment, it is briefly comprehended in this saying, namely, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. That law, that moral law is still there. Grace comes to help us to fulfill the moral law. Mercy comes to help us and make us live in a merciful way and be obedient to the moral law and love our neighbors as ourselves. Look at James chapter 2 and we're reading from verse 8. James chapter 2 verse 8. It says, and if thou fulfill the royal law, the royal law, the kingly law, and the law that God gives to the people who are sons of the king, servants of the king, children of the king, if ye fulfill the moral law according to the scripture, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself ye do well we're coming to number three here number three is the law for the new creature in the new covenant we come to the new covenant coming to the new covenant does that cancel the moral law look at the word of god it tells us in hebrews chapter 8 Verse 6, Hebrews chapter 6, verse 7, But now, as he obtained a more excellent ministry, by how much he, he, he also is the mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. Verse 10, in verse 10, it says, For this, in the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their mind and write them in their hearts, and I will be to them a God, their God, and they shall be to me a people. When we come up into the new covenant and we're committed to the Christ of the new covenant, we're also committed to the commandment, new commandment in the new covenant, and he writes the law in our heart because he wants us to understand uh, if in the Old Testament those commandments were reaching uh, on tables of stone and they were kept in the in the ark of the covenant and not everybody can go there and read it but now a better thing a new thing that he writes those commandments in our had. Look at chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 16. It says, This is the covenant that I will make of them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws 
into their hearts and in their minds will I write them. In their minds will I write them. In Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. Second Peter chapter 1, reading from verse 3. It says, according as his divine power, he has given unto us all the promises all the things that pertain to life and godliness and it says through the um, through the knowledge of him that has called us to glory and to virtue he has not called us to vice he has not called us to sinfulness he has not called us to a crime, criminality, no. He has called us to glory and he has called us to virtue in verse 4. In verse 4, it says, in verse 4, it says, whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these ye might be partakers of the divine nature. The divine nature. The divine nature requires righteousness, requires holiness, requires obedience to the law of God. Angels in heaven that contradicted the law of God they were driven out and there's no way that God will accommodate will embrace those who are deliberate in offending God and going against the moral law and then they say God is merciful and they use the mercy of God against the majesty of God no way he gives us precious and great promises that by these promises ye may be partakers of the divine nature having escaped the corruption that is in the world through loss galatians chapter 6 verse 2 galatians chapter 2 uh, chapter 6 verse 2 look at something here it says that will bear ye one another's body and so fulfill the law of christ not the law of moses not the law of ceremonies not the laws of rituals christ uh, has his own law and he says you come to him you live in him you don't use his goodness against him his grace against him his mercy against him and then you trample under the law of christ to love the lord your god with all your heart all your soul all your mind to love your neighbor as yourself you trample that under feet because you are using and misusing and misinterpreting the might of god and the mercy of god bear ye one another's body and so fulfill the law of Christ. The Lord give every one of us understanding. Amen. The Lord give you understanding. I'm coming to number two here. Number two, we're looking at the love in the gospel of grace. The grace we have in Christ. There are three things we're looking at here. Number one, we're looking at the compassion and the love of God for us. Number two, we're looking at the commandment and life in the gospel by us. Number three, we're looking at the commitment to the law of life in Christ. Number one is the compassion. The compassion and the love of 
God for us in John chapter 3 verse 16 John 3 verse 16 for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life sin came into the world and sin has come into every life to make everyone perish and the lord god in heaven has sent the lord jesus christ his only begotten son why is it to tolerate the sin that kills us no is to take away the grace of god that comes christ that comes the compassion of the lord that comes is to take away our sin if it tolerates sin that should have been done at the garden of eden to tolerate sin and to say you've done that that's all right no it's all wrong. It cannot be right. It is wrong to speak in the face of the Creator and to do what we shouldn't have done. But because of His love, He sent Christ so that He will take away our sin. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. And ye know that he was without sin. But he came and manifested himself that he might take away all iniquity from us. For he shall redeem Israel from all their sins. He came not to tolerate our sin, but to take away our sin look at verse uh, look at um, romans chapter 5 uh, we're looking at verse 18 romans chapter 5 uh, verse 8 it says but god commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners christ died for us why did he die because we were sinning because we were in sin and we couldn't extricate, extricate, extricate ourselves, take away ourselves, overcome the sins by ourselves. Because of that is Saint One. Not that will encourage our sin, is Saint One. It's only begotten sin. Not that will tell us. That's all right, I shall die for you. I give you license now, go on sinning. No, it's to take away, it's to make us escape, it's to make us overcome the sin that brought Christ into the world to die at Calvary. It says, God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. Christ died for us. And then he tells us in verse 9, in verse 9, it says, much more than being now justified, being now forgiven by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Because he helps us not to continue in sin. But we continue with the Savior now. We shall be saved from wrath through him. And then in verse 10, in verse 10, for if when we were, were, were in the past, when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son. He says much more. Be reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. That's what he's done. And he wants us now to realize that the death of Christ did not come to give us license 
to continue in sin, he came to give us liberation from the sin and from the evil. Look at number two here. Number two, we're looking at the commandment and life in the gospel, the commandment for us and the life by us. It tells us in John chapter 13, verse 34. John chapter 13, verse 34, it says, A new commandment I give unto you that ye love one another. You love your parents. You want your parents to be happy. You take care of them. You'll honor them. You'll obey them. You put a smile on their mouth. You are available to do what a child ought to do legitimately and lovingly to your parents. That's the new commandment that you love one another. And you love your brothers and sisters. You love them as Christ has loved you. You're not going to cheat them. You're not going to insult them. You're not going to walk against them. You're not going to hinder them. You're not going to do anything that will hurt them. That she love one another. You love your neighbor. You want your neighbor to be happy. You want your neighbor to be healthy. And you want good things for your neighbor. You're not going to make them angry deliberately. You're not going to hurt them in any way. It's the moral law that the Lord is still emphasizing in a deeper way, in a higher way, with a brother, a brother interpretation and application that she love one another as I have loved you. As I have loved you. Can you imagine, can you think of Christ disobeying the commandments of the Lord because it's Christ and then he becomes independent of the law of God. Never. And he says, as I have loved you, that she also love one another. <laughs> Loving is not smiling when you are cutting down the man behind him. Loving is not, you know, I love you, I love you, I love you. When you hate the woman behind and the things to say behind is to destroy him, to destroy her. That's not love. It's what you do behind what you do in the presence, what you do with the person that shows that love, that convinces that man, that woman, he loves me, she loves me. I found your money and I picked it up. I brought it back to you. Not that I stole it and then I go to spend it and then I come to say, you know, my brother, I love you. No, love will not contradict the commandment of of God. It tells us in verse 35, in verse 35, by this shall all men know that ye are my disciples if ye have love one to another. In 1 Corinthians, I'm reading from chapter 13. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, we're reading from verse 1. It says uh, over here, it says though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels, and have not love charity. I am become a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal, lifeless. And then in verse 2, in verse 2 it says, Though and though I have all the gifts of prophecy and understand all mysteries, and know and all knowledge and though i have all faith so that i could remove mountains and have not charity love i am nothing if i don't have this love to god with all my heart all my soul 
all my might, all my strength, if I trample under the desirous law of God, and then I run after, I prophesy, I have faith, I remove mountains, there's healing, there's deliverance, and I'm able to pray for anything and get anything. It says, I'll still be as nothing in the sight of God. And that my nothingness in the sight of God will close the door of heaven against me. Think about that. That just prophesy, just pray, just give miracle, just have miracle. If you don't have the love towards God that obeys his commandment, and the love towards man that will not hurt him, that will do something practical and positive, progressive in his life. It says, you'll be nothing. Look at verse 3. In verse 3, it says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, you're generous. But in your generosity, there are Ten people, you give money to this one, you give clothes to this one, generous, but you have hatred and animosity to number three, and you have a contrary life to number four, and you have bad, bad things, life, living against number six and against the rest of them. The generosity you manifest on number one, number two, will not take away the wrath and the judgment of God. You'll still be as nothing. That's the reason why we come to the Lord in a balanced way. And we're not asking for grace and license to do evil, to have our human nature evil nature, sinful nature, to be covered up. And then we just say, I live on the love of God and hatred for men. No. It says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burnt, it says, and have not charity, love. It says, I will be a person that does not profit the kingdom, not profit myself, and eternity will reveal that it profits me nothing. Look at verse 4. In verse 4, charity, love, suffereth longer. Charity is kind. A kind person will not commit adultery with another man's wife. A loving person, kind, compassionate person will not commit immorality with somebody else's husband. We keep the moral law of God by the Christ of love that dwells in us and charity it's kind. Charity envieth not. Charity vaunteth not itself. It's not puffed up. Verse 5, it says, it does not behave itself unseemly. If you are rude to your father, to your mother, you behave yourself unseemly. If you take what does not belong to you without the consent of the person that has that thing, you behave unseemly. If you are in the path of duty and you contradict the principle of progress, you're walking unseemly. It says, seeketh not her own. The people who are self-centered and they seek only their joy at the expense of other people 
I like to do that. But the other person is hurt, he's injured by what you like to do. I like to talk like that. I like to say that. And you say that at the expense of the other person who is caught, who is pinched, who is pricked by what you do. You're not walking for the benefit of the other person. You're seeking your own thing. Seek it, not her own. And it says, it's not easily provoked. And he thinketh no evil. Thinketh no evil. Look at verse 6. In verse 6, it says, He rejoiceth not in iniquity, but he rejoices in the truth. And then in verse 7, verse 7 tells us, He beareth all things, He believeth all things, but He doesn't believe a lie. Because the Lord says, There is strong delusion to believe a lie. Don't believe a lie. Believe the truth. Believe all the promises of God in heaven. And believe everything that the Lord has revealed about grace. Believe. About mercy. Believe. About compassion of Christ. Believe. About the warning of Christ. Believe about the righteousness the Lord has demanded believe he believeth all things he hopeth all things and uh, he endureth all things we're looking at Philippians chapter 2 and I'm reading from verse 3 Philippians chapter 2 and we're looking at verse 3 it says let nothing be done through strife of vain glory but in lowliness of mind you hear the word of God don't lift yourself exalt yourself above the word of God you had had this thought this idea, this concept, and now the word of God says that thought is wrong. That concept is wrong. And so you now want to bend and bow under the authority of the word of God. You don't want to do anything that shows that you are exalting your own idea, your own opinion, your own feeling above the word of of God. But with lowliness of mind, let each one esteem the other better than themselves. In verse 4, verse 4 tells us, it says, look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. In verse 5, verse 5 says, Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind in Christ Jesus. What's the mind? I always do the things that pleases my Father. And the mind that should be in you, you always do the things that please the heavenly father, then you descend here on earth, that please your spiritual father, then you descend on earth, that please your earthly father. The might of Christ that will not hate other people, kill other people. And Peter draw the sword and cut off the ear. And Jesus Christ took down picked up the cut ear and then fixed it back and he said, Peter, put your sword back because everyone that carries the sword will die by the sword. The mind that was in Christ, you will not kill, you will not steal. The mind that was in Christ, you will not bear false witness. The mind that was in Christ, you will not covet anything that belongs to other people. The moral law still holds 
in our lives. We're coming here to number three now. Number three is the commitment to the law of life in Christ. The commitment we have to the law of life in Christ. In uh, Romans chapter 8, we're looking at verse 2. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 2, it says, for the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made me free from the law of sin and death. There's the law of life in Christ. You come to Christ, you do not live as you used to live. You do not go the places you used to go. You do not dress like you used to dress. You do not drink the thing that turns the head, that intoxicates like you used to do. But now, the law of the spirit of life in Christ Jesus has made you free from the law of sin and death. It tells us in, in chapter 1 of James, James chapter 1, reading from verse 21, James chapter 1, reading from verse 21, it says, Wherefore, lay aside, lay apart all filthiness. That's New Testament. That's the new covenant. That's what he has called us to. That we lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness. And receive with meekness, with lowliness, with humility. It says we receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul will receive the word wholeheartedly. We receive the word with all our heart, all our soul, all our mind. We receive the word believingly, so that that word will change, turn around our lives. In verse 22, it says, Be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. If we say we come to the Savior, and we hold on to the sins of our past life, we're deceiving ourselves. If we say we have the grace of God and hold on to all the iniquities and transgressions of the past life, we deceive ourselves. But if we're coming to the kingdom and we know every kingdom has a king, and a king that rules as his principle, as his law, as his demand, as his commandment. Now I am in the kingdom of God. Now I am saved. Now I am a child of God. And I live by the law of the king in the kingdom. And I live by the precept of the king in the kingdom, then I am not deceiving myself. That's why it says, but be ye doers of the word that are not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. You're not deceiving yourself. I can't hear you. Amen. Who is deceiving himself? The one that lives on earth. And then he leaves contrary to the commandment of God. And he tells himself, heaven, I'm going to get to heaven. And then he gets to the gate of heaven eventually. And he says, why are you coming to this gate? Oh, he says, I am so and so. I'm a child of God. Are you a child of God? I believed in the mercy of God. Did you believe in the majesty of God? Did you believe in the meaningful law of God? Did you believe in the model Christ that he has given us? I didn't think of that. He deceives himself. He'll be turned away, turned away, turned away from the gate of heaven. But if you, by grace, if you, by the mercy of God, 
have the transformation of life. I come to Christ. And Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And you become doers of the world. When the gate of heaven opens, you'll go in in Jesus' name. Look at First Corinthians chapter 15. I'm reading there from verse 33. In First Corinthians chapter 15, we're looking at verse 33. It says, be not deceived. Evil communications corrupt good manners. In verse 34, it says, awake to righteousness. Wake up to righteousness and uh, sin not. We come to the grace of God, wake up, awake to righteousness, and sin not. We have received the salvation of God by the mercy of God, awake to righteousness, and sin not. Hebrews chapter 12 we're looking at verse 14. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14. Follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. Uh, we need to have remembrance of that every time. When you are happy, have remembrance of that. Don't let the happiness take you across the fence. Always remember, you are happy, follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall save the Lord. There are times we are sad. There are times we are sorrowful. There are times we cry and weep. Don't let your tears block your sight. And still remember, in the midst of that sorrow, in the midst of that grief, for the peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. There are times we are healthy, there are times we are so strong, and we can jump to the top of any mountain. That's good, that's good. But follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. There are times we are sick, face it sickness and the sickness brings you down it depresses you it makes you feel what is this all right all right healing will come before that healing comes follow peace with all men there are people when they're sick when they, when they lose something, you know, their emotions change. Anger comes. And the depression makes them to have a boisterous emotion. Be careful. Because we don't know the last sickness somebody will have that will take him to the great beyond. Even when you are down. Even when you're sick, even when there might be pain in the body and pain all around, all the same. This is what we always need to remember, that we follow peace with all men and holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. We're coming to point number three. Point number three, we're looking at the Lord of the godly, living, wholeheartedly for Christ, wholeheartedly, with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul, with everything within you, you're living wholeheartedly unto the Lord. In Psalm 16, I'm reading here from verse 5. Psalm 16, verse 5, it says, the Lord is my is the Lord is the portion of my inheritance and of my cup. Thou maintainest my Lord. He says, I've come to Christ. He is, Christ is my Savior. 
God is my father. The Holy Ghost is my helper and comforter. I have come. And now the Lord is the Lord of my life. Verse 6, in verse 6, it tells us, it says, The times are falling unto me in present places. Yea, I have I have a goodly heritage. Look at verse 7. In verse 7 it says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel. Who has given me counsel. You know, if you have the counsel of God, you are going to follow the moral law he has established. Aaron that raised up a golden calf. He didn't follow the counsel of the Lord. When we follow the counsel of the Lord, we'll not make any image like unto God. When we follow the counsel of God, we're not going to take the name of the Lord in vain. When we follow the counsel of the Lord, shall I honor his day? And shall I, or shall I dishonor his day? When we follow the counsel of the Lord, you will remember the day of the Lord to keep it holy and righteous and to worship God and to remember him. When we follow the counsel of the Lord, we're still going to honor our parents. We're still going to respect our parents and we're still going to be obedient unto them. When we follow the counsel of the Lord, we're not going to steal, we're not going to kill, we're not going to bear false witness and we're not going to covet anything that belongs to other people. Don't follow Follow your own counsel, your own depraved counsel. Don't follow the counsel of sinners in the world. You follow the counsel of the Lord, and the counsel of the Lord will lead you in the direction of the commandments of the Lord. It says, I will bless the Lord who has given me counsel, and it says, my reins also I shall instruct me in the night seasons. Look at verse 8. In verse 8, it says, I have set the Lord always before me. I have set the Lord always before me so that the light of his countenance will shine up for me and shine and show the path and the way that I should take every time because he is at my right hand I shall not be moved. It tells us in verse 9, in verse 9 it says, it says, therefore my heart is glad and my glory rejoices and it says that my flesh also shall rest in hope. Look at verse 11. In verse 11 it tells us, it says, thou wilt show me the path of life. What's the path of life? It's the path of love. What's the path of life? It's the path of light. What's the path of life? It's the path of the law of God. And it says, in thy presence is the fullness of joy that my wrath. And it says, at thy right hand, there are pleasures forevermore. The Lord of the godly living wholeheartedly for Christ. We're looking at three things here. Number one, we're looking at the holiness and healing for the law abiding. Number two, we're looking at the horror of hell for all law breakers. Number three is the happiness in heaven for loyalty 
to the Lord. Look at number one. Number one is the holiness and healing for the law abiding. The people that obey the law, the people that abide in the law of Christ, in the law of the Lord, in the law of God. It tells us in Hebrews chapter 12, Verse 14, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. And then he tells us in verse 15, in verse 15, he says, looking, he uh, says, we we'll look uh, so that the watch of God, the goodness of God, the grace of God, were looking at that diligently, lest any man, anyone fail of the grace of God. Look at that. Somebody can fail of the grace of God for short of the grace of God when he holds the grace in isolation and he allows sin. He allows backsliding. He allows every evil thing to come into his life and he's shouting grace, 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 always grace. And you fall short of that grace of God, of that love of God. He says, looking diligently, lest any man, anyone fail of the grace of God, lest there be in any of you a heart of unbelief and then it says that will bring trouble and thereby many will be defiled a leader sin is a leading sin a person that says i have the grace of god i can do anything sir why are you doing that don't talk to me about that. I know more Bible than you know. The grace of God covers me. All those other people will go back into the world and they'll do evil things, transgressing things, and they will do sinful things because your sin as a leader will make other people misinterpret, misuse the grace of God. Look at verse 16. In verse 16, it says, Lest there be in any fornicator or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat or bread or food, a plate of food, a soul is birthright. And then in verse 17, it says, In verse 17, In verse 17, it says, and you know, that afterwards, when he realized what had happened, he had lost his birthright, he sought the birthright with tears, and it was impossible to recover that Again, he wants us to understand uh, that holiness must be the pattern uh, of our lives. And then uh, there will be the healing, inner healing, uh, outward healing, total healing. Because we have Christ. And he lives in us. And his grace demonstrates the holiness of life and the healing he provides by his sacrifice in second corinthians chapter 7 reading from verse 1 second corinthians reading from verse 1 you can read that in your bible it is telling us there that we perfect holiness in the goodness of god by the grace of god and we're free from all the defilement and we're free from all the filthiness of the flesh and of the spirit you remember isaiah came to Ezekiah and he said set your house in order for you will die and not live what did the man say he said oh lord remember how i walked before you in righteousness and with a perfect heart 
because of that holiness in his life, holiness drew healing into his life. And the Lord told Isaiah, go back to him and tell him, I've seen your tears and I've heard your prayer and you will live. And in fact, he added 15 years to his lifespan. He tells us in 3 John, having only one chapter, 3 John chapter 1 verse 2, he said, I wish, I pray, I desire above all things that you will be in health and you will prosper as your soul prospers. He gives us all those things in proportion to the holiness of life, the righteousness of life that we have. Holiness and healing, holiness and health, holiness and happiness, holiness and joy, holiness and heaven, they go together. And what God has put together, let no man separate. We'll come to number two. Number two here is the horror of hell for all lawbreakers. The horror of hell for all lawbreakers. Breakers, the people that you know say can do whatever. There's going to be the final horror. There's going to be the final suffering in the lake of fire and in hell. Oh, some people say there's only one sin, only one sin drove Adam and Eve out of the Garden of Eden. There's only one sin. One sin, only one sin, drove Nadab and Abihu out of this life as they offered the strange fire. Only one sin, only one sin, that they made some sin to fall into the hands of the Philistines. Only one sin, one sin, Solomon, only one sin, made God to be angry with him. It's only one sin, only one one sin that drove Judas Iscariot from this earth to the horror of hell. Only one sin, it, it, that's the sin that made Ananias and Sapphira to die suddenly and to go to the other side. And they're now in the lake of fire forever and ever. The Lord spoke about the horror of sin and the horror of hell that awaits the people that are going to perish forever and ever. Read your Bible, you'll understand that you say, except you repent, you shall all, all likewise perish. And the people in Revelation that receive the mark of the beast, and they live the beastly life, and they live the lawless life, and they were lawbreakers, those people, they were cast into the lake of fire, and the smoke of their torment went off forever and ever, and they have no rest. Those people that receive the mark and the nature and the practice of the evil one, there is hellfire. And Jesus spoke about it, and those who remain in their lawlessness, in their law-breaking, they're going to spend eternity in the lake of fire. I come to number three. Number three is the happiness in heaven for loyalty to the Lord. Those who are loyal to the Lord, they come to the Lord and they believe in the Lord and they continue. They continue following after the Lord. They continue in the way of the Lord. They are the people that are going to be with him in heaven. It says in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. Not for the lawless, not for the lawbreaker, for the loyal. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. It says at the end of time, he'll send forth his angels from the fall and he'll gather together the righteous and he'll gather them into the kingdom of God and they will ever, ever rejoice before the Lord. They say, blessed be the Lord who has begun 
begotten us unto, unto a new hope, unto a lively hope. And then he says, we're going to have the inheritance reserved for us in heaven if you bring him back the principle of life and the practical law of God in your heart and in your life. The Lord has said you are going to spend eternity with him in heaven. One of these days the trumpet shall sound. He says, I tell you the truth, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in the twinkling of an eye. It says the trumpet shall sound and the dead in Christ shall rise and we which are alive we shall be with the Lord in the air and he says we will well, not even proceed or prevent or hinder them that are asleep that the dead in Christ shall rise for us and then because we are alive in Christ alive in the faith alive in righteousness alive in hope alive in the goodness of the Lord he says we're going to to be with the Lord. Finally, lawbreakers are going to be away from the Lord forever. They're going to be in hell forever. They lift up their eyes in torment and they might shout, they might call. Father Abraham sent Lazarus to dip his finger in water and cool my tongue in this place for I'm tormented. And Father Abraham will say, remember in your lifetime you have all those good things but uh, Lazarus are all evil things. Now he is comforted and thou art tormented. And he says, okay, send uh, somebody to go and tell my people, my brethren on earth. He says, if they do not hear the prophets and, the, and, and Moses and the prophets, they are not going to repent. Even if another person comes to them from the grave. That means then, and there's no, and there's a great goal between us and you, so that the people that want to pass over here or pass over there cannot. When somebody goes to hell, that place is forever and ever. The place, the pain, the torture, the torment, the horror of hell is forever and ever because they are lawbreakers. And God will not have lawbreakers to live within forever and ever. But when you are loyal, when you are loving, when you are obedient to the word of God and you live by the love of God, loving God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your your strength and you love your neighbor as yourself and every time you go about you think in love you walk in love you behave in love and your life is a kind of epitomized by the love of God then you go to heaven Permanently, you'll be there. He says, I put life and death before you. I put joy and sorrow before you. Choose life, choose joy. And choose eternal life that ye may live. Today, the choice is in your hand. You can choose salvation. You can choose sanctification. You can choose holiness. You can choose health. You can choose the goodness of God. And your choice will determine your destiny forever and ever. Today, I counsel you. Today, the Lord counsels you that you will choose life. I said you will choose life. And you will choose love and you will choose the law of God and live by that law of God so that in eternity, when they are calling the names, we will hear your name. Yeah. You'll have a seat there. Yeah. You'll have position there. And you'll be forever, forever, forever with the Lord in Jesus' name. Let's rise up now and talk to the Lord in prayer. The Lord has spoken to us. It's not an indulgent God. It's a God of love and yet a God of principle, a God that has a law. And he wants us, he wants you, he wants him, he wants her, he wants everyone to be and to abide 
in that law of God. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord in prayer. Are you the one, the careless one, that has been taking the grace of God for granted? The mercy of God for granted? Are you the lawless one that has been thinking that always the grace of God will go beyond your sin? Didn't do that for Adam and Eve. Pray and say, Lord, I plead for your mercy on my ignorance. Living licentiously because you're thinking of grace, grace, grace. And you make God an indulgent God, a blind God that cannot see your evil. Tell the Lord, I'm sorry. You cannot pretend. You know, the law of God is written in the conscience of every creature, everyone. That law is written in your heart. And when you become a convert of Christ, the law, the law of love towards God and love towards our neighbor, that law is written in your heart. When you come to the experience of the new covenant, that law is written in your heart. And any time you break the law of God, your conscience alerts you that heaven is watching and heaven knows and heaven sees what you are doing carnal, careless, corrupting. And then you go, if you are wise, you go to the Lord in confession. You go to the Lord, say, no, Lord, here I am. Have mercy on me, a lawbreaker. Have mercy on me, the person that takes the grace of God for license. Have mercy on me. And it is that mercy that will take away your sin, transform your life. It will not tolerate sin. But it will transform your life. Grace, grace, God's grace. Deeper than the ocean, higher than the sky, broader than the horizon. Grace comes not to encourage your sin, but to exterminate, take away the power of that sin from your life. It breaks the power of cancelled sin. And makes you to rise up and walk and live in righteousness. Transformation. Triumph. That's what grace does. Tell the Lord, you will not say you have not heard. When you love the Lord, you love his law. When you love Christ, you love the commandments of Christ. When it touches you, when it transforms you, it makes your life clean. Dirt, 
defilement or get out of your life permanently. Is compassion brings conversion. His compassion is not to leave us in sin and then make us to go to hell forever. That's not compassion. His compassion is not to gloss over our sin and then we perish forever. That's not compassion. His compassion does not leave us serving the devil. Then we go to hell forever with the devil. That's not compassion. His compassion brings conviction, brings confession, and brings total change into our lives. He brings his commandment unto you. A new commandment I give unto you that you love. your brother, that you love your sister, not that you corrupt your neighbor. He has commanded us that we love our neighbor, not that we're lost after our neighbor, not that we corrupt them, not that we pet them in their sin. The love of God brings salvation. Real salvation. True salvation. Brings a change of life. And makes us look more like Christ. When you love God, you are committed to his way of life. You are committed to what gives him joy, what makes him glad. I have no greater joy than to see that my children are walking in the truth. When you love God, you'll walk in the truth. You live in the truth. You abide in the truth. And you love sound doctrine. And you don't walk against sound doctrine. When you're a real child of God. Tell the Lord every day of your life, you will not misuse grace. Every day of your life always, you will not misinterpret grace to give you liberty to do as you please, to carry on with your old nature. Grace. Interpret it right. Grace. Accept it, transforming power. Grace. And be committed to tell you to the pardoning, purifying grace of God. Remember, holiness is central in the life of a real child of God. Happy or sad, for the holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Rich or poor, Holiness 
without which no man shall see the Lord. Healthy or sick, holiness, without which no man shall see the Lord. What shall he profit a man? If he gains the whole world and he loses a soul, I don't justify sin, only one sin is so. Only one sin. That's what made him lose the birthright. Only one sin, Solomon. That's what made him lose the favor of God and the kingdom was divided. Judas. Only one sin. That's what has led him now to the horror of hell forever and ever. Simon, give me this power. I'll give you money. One sin. He dwelt in the gall of bitterness. Only one seen, Ananias and Sapphira. How has Satan filled your heart to lie to the Holy Ghost? You have not lied unto man, you have lied unto God. Only one seen, but careful. Something only one sin lost his sight, lost his power, lost his position of authority in the land. Only one sin, David. Only one sin, he brought havoc, danger, harm, judgment to his family. It's driven away from the throne. Only one sin. Grace, grace. Don't misinterpret the grace of God. Grace and godliness. Holiness in your life. Grace and the goodness of God, the hope of heaven forever and ever. As the Lord, that by his mercy, he will save you from sin. It will restore you back to life eternal. Change your heart. Change your mind. Change your nature. And bring the divine nature in your life, in your heart. And the grace of God will teach you to deny ungodliness. What he lost will teach you to be righteous and godly in this present world, looking for the appearance of the Lord when he comes, and he comes for his own who are law abiding, who are loyal. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Give me a good, good alpha location. Amen. Amen.
The grace of God transform your life. The grace of God empower your life. And the grace of God give you good understanding in the way of the Lord in Jesus' name. Holiness for you. Healing for you. Humility for you. And at last, heaven for you in Jesus' name. Raise up that hand. We're going to pray together. Father, in the wonderful name of Jesus, we all come to you. We're asking, Lord, that every sin of the past, every misinterpretation of the past, every license in evil of the past, let there be conviction in every life in Jesus' name. And Lord, let our lives reflect proper scriptural confession in Jesus name and Lord make us not converts of men not converts of false prophets not converts of people who turn the Bible upside down make us the converts of Christ implant in us the life of Christ the law of Christ and the love of Christ in Jesus name and we pray the life we live henceforth will be a life of humility a life of honesty a life of holiness that Lord none of us after hearing the clear word of God will go to hell in Jesus name block hell away from us block us from the gate of hell and Lord will pray none of us by carelessness by disobedience none of us by being adamant in evil will face the horror of hell forever and ever in Jesus name Amen. cleanse everyone Amen. you've corrected us help us Lord to stay in the path of correction and rectitude Amen. help us to remain at peace with all men every time and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. Amen. Take away the nature of Esau from every one of us. Amen. Take away the disobedience of Saul away from us in Jesus' name. Amen. Take away that determined evil in the heart of Judas from every one of us in Jesus name the life of Enoch the life of Samuel the life of Daniel the life of John the Baptist the life of Paul the Apostle the life of those who know the Lord and follow the Lord with all their heart, with all their soul, with all their mind, with all their strength. Give to every one of us in Jesus' name. That when Christ shall come and when the trumpet shall sound, Lord and the dead in Christ rise, we will be raptured people of God in Jesus' name. The life that is rapturable, the godliness that is rapturable, the holiness that makes us rapturable, grant to everyone without exception. And from now on, help us to live according to the law of Christ in our heart in Jesus' name. Write that law on the table of the heart of everyone so that, Lord, our lives will bring glory to you from day to day in Jesus' name. 
Lord, any sickness there, you are the one that gives us holiness and health and healing. I pray healing for your people in Jesus' name. Destroy the works of the devil. And Lord, in health, in joy, in happiness, in holiness, will be walking the path of life. And that wicked one will not touch us anymore in Jesus' name. Confirm your power. Confirm your miracle. Confirm your healing. Confirm your holiness in every life. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Another amen. God has blessed you. You go back home in the blessing of the Lord. In Jesus' name.